the Delmarva Almanac. Each week, we connect you to the best of Delmarva. I'm your host, Dana Kester McCabe. One attraction that brings history buffs and nature lovers to Snow Hill is the nearby Nassawango Iron Furnace, also known as Furnace Town. Located in the lush Pocomoke Forest, the property's border backs up to the Nature Conservancy's Nassawango Preserve, and they share a hiking trail. This is a great place to hike, particularly in the spring. You can see wildflowers unique to the area, like the pink lady slipper orchid. It's a nesting area for the prothonotary warbler, a beautiful little bird, as well as many other birds, turtles, and more. The furnace itself rises up in the forest looking more ancient and mysterious than it really is. It's historically significant partly because it has been recognized as the earliest surviving hot blast furnace in the United States. Colonial residents of the region discovered bog iron in the swamps of the Pocomoke River as early as the 1780s. Enterprising blacksmiths in the area melted the ore in their forges and used it to create household items like nails, hinges, and other hardware. There seemed to be a great supply of the bog iron, so the Widener Furnace Company began operations in the area in 1788 when they purchased 4,800 acres in the Pocomoke River Forest. In 1828, the Maryland Iron Company took it over, and the Nassawango Iron Furnace was built. The process of turning lumps of iron into workable metal was not too complicated. The ore was dug from the swamp. Trees from the forest were cut and burned to make charcoal, which was used to fuel the furnace. Oyster and clam shells were brought in from coastal shellfish companies. The ore, the charcoal, and the shells were loaded in layers in the furnace and set ablaze. A large billow powered by a water wheel would keep the fire burning at a high temperature so that the iron would melt and flow into channels in the sand floor where it cooled. The finished products were oblong bars called pigs. These were loaded onto barges on the creek and shipped to other larger foundries in Baltimore and Philadelphia. Some of the metal was cast into smaller items like hardware and kitchen pots to sell locally. In 1835, they upgraded the technology of the furnace from a cold air process to what is known as hot blast. This meant that now hot air was used in the furnace billows to stoke the fire. This engineering feat was accomplished by modifying the chimney with dampers which recycled the heat created by the fire and channeling it back into the stove enclosure. It was a more efficient process that had already been adopted by other foundries. Unfortunately, the company fell into debt trying to catch up to industry standards. The operation was sold a couple of times, eventually becoming the property of a Snow Hill lawyer and entrepreneur named Thomas Spence in 1837. Under Spence's ownership, the furnace produced over 700 tons of iron annually. It ran 24 hours a day from early spring until the first hard freeze. A small village grew up around the iron furnace. There was a manor house for the company manager, a small church, and a few shops to accommodate the needs of the approximately 300 workers who lived there in small cottages. If you've just joined us, I'm Dana Kester McCabe, and we're talking about Furnace Town. Despite the small community built to support it and the ambitious production schedule, within a decade the Nassawango Iron Furnace fell on hard times. Like his predecessors, Thomas Spence could not make a go of it. Though a reliable supply of bog iron was there, the market was weak, and the small profits gained could not meet the expense of hiring a consistent labor force willing to do the difficult and sometimes dangerous work. The furnace operation was closed down, and the once bustling village was abandoned. By 1860, the only person left in the ghost town was a gentleman named Samson Harmon. Samson was a free man of color who was born in 1790 and raised in the area. He was very tall and often wore a hat but no shoes. In his youth, he was known for his athletic ability. It was said that he could run down a deer and wrestle it to the ground. For much of his life, he worked at the iron furnace as a laborer. Then, after the business closed, he served as a sort of caretaker, living off the land on the property with his family. They grew their own food and bartered crops for supplies in nearby Snow Hill. Samson and former company owner Thomas Spence were thought to be the inspiration for two characters in a lurid novel written in the 1880s. Their names were changed, only slightly in Samson's case, to keep the author George Townsend out of legal trouble. The book, 
The Entailed Hat is mostly the story of Patty Cannon, infamous kidnapper and serial killer from further up the peninsula in Reliance, Maryland. Samson's namesake in the tale was a slave and a brawler who loved to fight for the fun of it. The attention he received from the book's notoriety was not welcomed by Samson. He gave an interview in 1895 to the Salisbury Advertiser, refuting the presumption everyone had that he was the person in the book. He wanted people to know that he was never a slave and that he was of good character. The book was, after all, a work of fiction, never intended to serve as the historical record. Samson must have been an interesting interview. At the time, he was already over 100 years old. Neighbors enjoyed visiting him and his black cat, Tom, to hear him tell stories about the old days working at the Iron Furnace. They tried to check on him and help him out in those later years. Local authorities felt, however, that the most compassionate thing they could do was force him off his beloved homestead and into the local poorhouse, where he eventually died at the age of 107. He wanted to be buried near the Iron Furnace, but was instead laid to rest in Snow Hill. There are some who claim that his spirit and that of his cat continue to return to the place he had called home all of his life. After Samson's passing, the Nassauango Iron Furnace property was left unattended, changing hands a number of times. In 1962, it was donated to the Worcester County Historical Society by a woman named Georgie Smith Foster, who had inherited it from her father, Senator John Walter Smith. The Historical Society cleared the property of overgrowth and restored the furnace structure. Buildings built in the 19th century were moved to the site to recreate the lost village. Now Furnace Town is a living history site where visitors can see artisans at work demonstrating traditional crafts from that era. It has been host to quilting shows, special Victorian-themed Christmas events, and the annual Celtic Festival held each October. The newest addition to the village is the Mount Zion One-Room Schoolhouse. It was originally built in 1869 up the road a piece in a little town called Whitton. After it was replaced with a new school in 1931, it was moved to Snow Hill and operated as a museum. It is hoped that the building will be ready for visitors by this spring. Furnace Town and the Nature Trail through the Nassawango Preserve are open to the public April through October. To get links to them and to more information on this topic, visit our website, delmarvaalmanac.com slash history. Well, that's all for this edition of the Delmarva Almanac. We'd like to thank our community partners, the Friends of Delmarva Public Radio, the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore, and underwriters, eatdrinkbyart.com, for their help in bringing this program to you, our audience. Our theme music was provided by Brightside Studio. This show has been a Moonshell production. Thanks for listening. Until we meet again, may the rhythms and tides of Delmarva bring you good fortune.